Today on Time Out Coaching and in recognition of an incredible milestone of 1,000 games coached in the BBL, we are showing one of my original podcast guests, Coach Paul James of the Plymouth Raiders. This was first published in September 2020. At this time in, in Thames Valley, as, was there any, was there, uh, well, Brack, sorry, Bracknell, um, was there any time where you started thinking this, that I could become, I could get into coaching here? Was that, was that starting to become on the radar there? Well, I think what, what I did in Leicester was before I left, I, I, I went and got my level two coaching certificate anyway. Sure. Um, so I already had that. And then just like in most clubs nowadays, you go out and you do a bit of community work um, within schools, doing a bit of coaching and that. Uh, I actually started a um, central venue league um, down in, in Bratton when I, when I was there, which I still believe runs to this day. Yeah. Um, just coaching sort of, and it just started off with six teams really, sort of under 12s and under 14s, and it grew, it grew uh, tremendously well, um, and say it still runs to this day. Um, and so it was, it wasn't until I was kind of coming towards the end of my playing career where I then sort of a player assistant coach, but then I also went on to coach our, sec our second team. Um, and I don't, I don't think a lot of people know this, but I coached our second team that played in Division 2 at the time. I was kind of player coach for them. Just coached 17, 18-year-old boys who you know, are pretty talented but never played at that level before. I'm kind of just trying to show them the way really how we're going to do things. And we had so much fun. And that year I had uh, a young Mike Martin on that team. Wow. Um, that year. Right. And... Uh, he, I mean, he was a bit flaky back then, for sure. I mean, oh, sure. We'd, we'd, we'd show up and uh, to meet him somewhere, and you know, he may be there, he may not be there. But when he was there, we we had a lot of fun. But the young Mike Martin and um, Mickey Betts also played every now and again when he was available. But, but but again, just to give these young kids a bit of experience and to show them the way, and we ended up finishing third in the league that year, and and going to Wembley uh, in the playoff finals and winning it. And I guess that was my first taste of. Actually, this is okay. Yeah, <laughs> this, sure, is, sure. Fact, this is a great. This is a great feeling. You know, the I think I made the players we had better. I made them tougher, fitter, stronger. Um, taught them the game more than they knew knew before they started. And I thought oh, this this may be an opportunity right here. Um, and so it kind of went from there. I mean, in the following year, Thames Valley John Knight decided he was going to have um, a full time head coach. Because Mickey was only, while well, Mickey was there, he was only part-time because he taught at Tassis right. at the same time as well. So, um, you know, he wanted the full-time head coach because he wanted it to be a bit more um, professional, if you like. At the time when I first got there, we trained twice a week. And, wow. and, and that's kind of when played games on the weekend. And things have certainly moved on from then you know, dramatically. But at the time, I actually, in fact, I actually worked. I actually chose to work as well and, and play while I was down there. But... This, um, yeah, having won the um, playoffs final with the Division Two team, and the following year this job came up, you know, as you would do, well, I applied for the job, not thinking I had any hope in hell of getting it. Yeah. Um, but I guess having been there so long as a player and then doing what I did with the second team, uh, you know, John Knight, Mr. Knight, thought he'd give me an opportunity here. And it's, it's one of those where you say, actually, no, I'm not experienced enough, or you grab it with both hands and just see what you can do with it. And I, I grabbed the chance with both hands, and you know, here we are today. Yeah, that's an incredible, uh, that's, a, that's a really great, uh, the Carl Olsen thing, I just want to go back to that very quickly. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a theme, I think, with almost every single guest that we have, that there's this a, a unique person that's right there that just happens to have you know, like Curtis had, uh, you know, a, a teacher that was, you know, really involved in the game. I, my, my own um, secondary school first teacher was uh, assistant coach to Dave Fitness at Hemel and one other yeah. was the assistant coach to Humphrey East London Royals. That's our two secondary school PE teachers. And yeah. you, you almost have to have, it's almost luck, you know, beyond, uh, you know, unfortunately, some people in this country have had great luck and, uh, you know, to, 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 to have a name right at the start, like Carl Olsen is incredible, but that's an incredible journey that you've had there. Now you're, you become the head coach at Tem Thames Valley Tigers. Um, what was, what were your basketball, like, were you taking most of your playing kind of experiences? 
Uh, you know, I want to play tough defense. Uh, you know, I want to do this. What were the things that you were taking in as your early coaching philosophy? I think, first of all, <laughs> it scared the hell out of me because I'm like, what the hell am I doing? You know, just you, you're taking on this job that you, I mean, I literally had no experience. I've only coached a bunch of young boys in Division 2. I had no experience of uh, recruiting Americans or how that process works. Um, I'm now looking at players who I was playing with not too long ago. I'm now going to coach. I'm now going to coach them and deciding on what salaries they're getting and all that sort of stuff. It is just madness. Um, so the first person I called was Kevin Cadle. <laughs> Was the first person I called, and uh, he gave me a, a few words of uh, of advice, and um, I've kind of stuck to that. I'm not going to tell you what they were, but no. um, it's but, really it's, it kind of set me up. It's crazy interesting, though, Paul, because um, what you don't know is you that would have been 1997 for you, um, 1998. So I'm actually going back to, where I'm, uh, I'm going to edit this a little bit out anyway, but um, okay. that Division Two final might have been against me, but I can't remember. I forgot that you coached um, Thames Valley Tigers. In a briefest moment, I'm trying to remember about <laughs> London Towers junior team playing in Division Two because that's what we did. All those talented kids were playing. I up. think we beat you in the semifinals. semifinals. I'm, I'm almost yeah. certain because it just yeah. blocked the memory. But... I'm going to just make a couple of seconds here, but um, going back to the Kevin Cadle thing, um, I, uh, I also got the same piece of advice when I took my job to go to Iceland in 1998. That was for the two years. You know, Kevin yeah. was the head coach at London Towers and uh, we would be in the office together and he gave me my, my first piece <laughs> of advice when I got the, the head coach's job. So that's great stuff. So your your basic uh, uh coaching philosophy on the, with the team at that time was what after the recruitment of the tent players what what were you what were you stressing defense uh offense transition what what were you what were you trying to really i i i stressed defense initially and just really we're just going to try and outplay outwork um you know out muscle teams if we could um but above all to focus on what we needed to do as as a unit make sure that we had our stuff down pat rather than worrying about the opposition let, let them worry about us so to speak and and um so it's really just based around just being very very tough defensively you know um just around people doing their doing their jobs that they've been brought in to do basically and if we did that it would all sort of uh, fall on together but let's let's just be honest with each other play hard you know i wanted guys to figure out their own way sometimes as well it wasn't all about me and it was, it was going to be a collective um, and, and, you know, that, that first year was pretty tough. I had to be pretty tough on them. I, I, was, I, was, I was kind of, I didn't really know myself yet as a coach anyway, first year. Absolutely. Under, under a huge amount of pressure because at the time, most of the coaches in the league then are, are American. What? Anyway. We're, we're also talking, you know, from, you know, that period of time, you know, for the next seven or eight years. I mean, there was some, some heavy duty you know, I mean, well, we've already got one NBA champion, one next yeah, yeah. NBA assistant coach, you know, a, player, a coach that's coached China national team. I mean, there's a whole swathe of the coaches that have been very, very successful that came through the BBL at that time. And so, absolutely, I, think that, absolutely. Uh, I mean, everyone believes that there was a great, you know, there was a great set of coaches at that time. So that's yeah. even more respect to have to go against those guys. Were you... Um, saying this, were you uh, getting any other advice? Who was someone that was working with you, you know, assistant coaches or yeah. uh, entertainers? Well, Mickey, yeah, well, Mickey Betts was still, he's my assistant coach there. So he, he, he helped tremendously. And uh, actually, I, I take a lot from him and just the way he was and how, how calm he was with his exam. Now, and I played for a few coaches, a few coaches, you just think, wow, what, what are you saying? I just don't get it because just frantic all the time. So, uh, uh, that was um, me for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, but it's just, you know, it's learned a lot from Mickey and just, just the way he did things and, and just actually made us sort of believe in the reassurance by just being calm. Um, but the first year, I, I, was a bit of a, I was a bit of a nut, I must say, um, just because I felt I had to prove myself in this league where we had your know, uniqueness of the world, you know, your... Bob, you know, Bob, Bob Donalds of the world, you know, Billy Mims, you know, people like that, Nick Nurse and those, those guys. Just, um, 
and you know, and all pays well, well, how's this guy got the job? So the, the spotlight was on me, you know, the timeouts. Am I calling timeouts at the right time? What am I saying in the timeouts? So huge amount of pressure. So I was a bit crazy at the time with the players because I felt there's an opportunity um, and I needed to show them who is in charge. Right. You know, with, with it all. And it's either going to be my way at the time, it's either going to be my way or you can leave. Sure. Um, very different now, but at the time, that, that's the way it had to be. And were, at this time, were you, um, had you transitioned out of that kind of practice in the evening um, to more of a daytime practice or was it still evening based? What, what, were, what was the situation in regards to practice? Yeah, it was still um, evening based a little bit because obviously we still had players who were part time and who were working. Um, but the, the Americans who we had, I think we had five or six um, guys who were full time. Um, we they would be doing two a days plus their their weight sessions. So this was something whereby it wasn't left to them or us to be doing it on our own. It's like okay, now we're going to take it up another level and we'll have these sessions more organised um, and brought in sort of strength and conditioning coaches to help out in, in that respect really just to again take it from where it was to to where you know we, we wanted to be as a club and and it certainly paid off it certainly paid off in that first year um you know we, we got to the final against uh in the bbl cup got to the bbl cup final yeah. uh, against my mate mr mr donwald yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, that was an interesting build up around around that but um, we were fortunate enough to win that game and Say so that's the first. That's facing the first major trophy one as a, as a coach, and so that was a very special time. Yeah, that's great. Um, where was that final played, by the way? Where was... So I'm trying to remember now whether yeah, it's, I mean, I'm trying some to of this stuff is, uh, that's stuff is yeah, yeah. That's uh, that, that's a tough question. I uh, don't worry after yeah. those amount of years you did. <laughs> um, so now we're starting to get more rhythm. Um, you're starting to get more experience. Um, I want to ask a quick question about your philosophy on recruiting uh, players. Firstly, let's talk about the imports. Um, what were the types of um, characteristics you were looking at um, in those players? Because you recruited some great, and you always recruited some great import players um, and character guys and stable, steady, uh, being able to deliver night in, night out. So what were, what were you seeing and looking for in those days? I think, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head and the kind of guy I was looking at, those, those people who, who've you know, been in the, if they've been in the college system, they have, you know, they've completed seasons. They haven't been injury prone. They haven't been, you know, bitty seasons. They're, you know, good guys, good characters. Um, and, and at the time, I only used maybe two or three agents because they knew what I, what I needed and how much I had to spend. And, and, and so I didn't need to be looking all over the place. And, and uh, you know, I think in a way, you, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And, and, and so I was able to recruit some fantastic players. Um, the first player I recruited was John McCord. Um, and, you know, I, I probably looked at his tape for about two minutes. And I, I can remember calling John Light up say, I need to come and speak to you about this player. He's coming straight out of Cornell University. Um, and in fact, Dan Davis was his agent at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so Dan was doing me a favor. Um, but we were, we were going to you know, pay John something we've never paid a rookie before. So I had to have a meeting about this. And yeah. now I can remember walking out of John Mike's office and he basically said, um, on your head, be it, basically. You can have him, but on your head, be it. And, uh, Wow, I mean, that's, that's, that's probably the best sign you've made ever, I think, in, you know, as far as just yeah. working with a guy who just could play multiple positions, um, fantastic character, you know, worked hard, you know, played hard, you know, real leader. And I think over his career within the BBL, whether it's with us or Glasgow or um, he was yeah. Cheshire as well, yeah. Chester, yeah, he averaged over 20 points and eight rebounds a game in every season. It was just, it doesn't happen now. Um, but he was a phenomenal, he's but phenomenal. But uh, Coach, he was, he was a winner. That was the first yeah, thing. Yeah, abs absolutely. That's how I would describe him. Yeah. You know, if you go into battle, you know, he was someone that was going to get you a win, get you a big yeah. win. Well, he always yeah. showed up in those big games. He was, he was a nightmare to deal yeah, with. Yeah, he, he, was, he, was, he was awesome. But then I also had guys who were at the club anyway. So I was quite, quite fortunate at the start because I had Jason Seaman, I, I had Casey Arena there well um Tony, uh, Trevor Gordon 
you know, um, th those guys, Tony, you know, Tony Harley later on, just those guys who were just, they were just winners. They, they had a good characters that they, they played hard, they want to win. And, and they play, they train the way we want to play. There's, there's no gray area about we train hard and then we, we show up to the game and all of a sudden we forget how to play the game. Um, you know exactly what you're going to get from them. And uh, it was, yeah, they were some tough guys and they respected me. I respected them for what they wanted to do. And, and it was a collective, you know, we, we did it collectively. Um, you know, as I, I don't profess to know everything and I still don't. And, and so, you know, I, it's an open door. If players want to come and talk to me about certain situations, we can talk about, we can look at it. I'll make the final decision on it, but you know, come and come and talk to me, so we all feel a part of, of what we're doing. So that's always been. I mean, I, I whenever I speak to coaches or uh, to players around the league, uh, players that have played for you, um, they've always said that you've got such a good feel for players, and and is that that's that's got to be part of your coaching DNA. I mean, is that what you're saying that you know you 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 encompass a lot of. Uh, uh, player input, but of course there has to be a limit to where that is. Would you say that that's that's fair in saying that? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think after my first two seasons, once I settled down, I, I then started to become more myself as, as far as the way I wanted to, uh, wanted to coach. I didn't, you know, want to go home and hate myself because of the way I've been because that's not really me. I wanted to be truly myself, and and as part of that is I am quite a calm, laid back person, and I will listen. My door's always open. Uh, and, and I wanted the players to feel a part of it. And I felt that if I can do that, it's gonna, it also puts a bit of responsibility back on the player as well uh, to what we're trying to do as, as a collective group. And, and if we can all come together and just do our jobs, and, and that's all, just do our jobs. Don't try and do anybody else's job. Do, do what you're paid to do. Um, you know, we, we, can, we, we can take this you know, quite far. Okay? Would you say that that, that philosophy I mean, is really where we're at in this day and age. Um, you know, this player empowerment, you know, giving a lot of responsibility to players to come up with the, you know, the correct decisions, you know, um, empowering them, you know, to feel that they're in, it, it, they, they've made part of that uh, decision-making process. You were doing that all the way back then um, versus, let's say, you know, I mean, uh, the Bobby Knight approach mm -hmm. is, you know, you, and I mean, I've even seen Nick Nurse do this because it's obviously super fun. <laughs> you really know Nick and you know, like toes to the line, you know, like he, yeah, yeah. You know, he would make people run when people didn't have the toes on the line, you know, that's a kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. so you, you, you've always had that kind of really flexible approach and, and, and letting players, you know, really have a, a voice with you as a coach. Yeah, I think so. And I, and I think, now I see that. Back then, I didn't really see that. I just felt this is the way we should be doing it. Sure. I, I didn't really understand maybe what I was doing or have a fancy word for it or whatever it is now. Um, but very much so, I was doing, doing it back then. And, and it's, it's probably come a long way now to the point where maybe you know, players have too much of a voice yeah. in, in, in it all. And, and it's all this, well, we've got to give them this, this power to do this. Well, they may not have the capacity to do that. I think back then, Plays with totally different as far as mentality and character um, and just what they want to do than, than they are now. Yeah. Um, and, and I think back then you could coach, yeah. you literally coach, and I think now we're doing more teaching than coaching. Yeah, sure. For whatever reason. Um, but that's, that's what I've seen over the last few years. Um, and that's why I felt that it's like, wow, I'm trying to do certain things here, but they don't get it. Um, maybe we can't give them as much empowerment to, to decide what to do because they're not making the simple things, doing the simple things well. So it's, it's kind of a, having to change the way we do things a little bit. So in this period of time, um, Thames Valley, you know, it's, um, you've got great continuity. Um, I'm going to tell you for now as, uh, as, a, as, a, as someone that's kind of paralleled almost in the same kind of air, uh, time frame. Um, extremely jealous because um, <laughs> you, you've got this stability, this this consistency. You're able to build year on year. You're able to really reflect, um, maybe make a minor uh, personnel change or believe in that personnel to keep getting better. Were you 
changing radically some of your some of your coaching like concepts were you changing some was it slowly starting to change were you going a little bit more up tempo um or you were just refining yourself and getting better in different areas of the game i think i was just really trying to as I say just refine myself a little bit and just try and become a little bit more knowledgeable every year just just do something a little bit more different um, to sort of change the way you were doing things, and, and again, the, the recruitment to the players as well. And I, you know, I was quite fortunate, you know, to be in a situation where, you know, the owner was, you know, into basketball, and he the, he gave us that stability and and had that, you know, throughout my whole career, really. Um, but it's just changed little tweaks here and there in the way I wanted to do things and how I wanted the players to be. Um, and and really, I just really believed in as far as my philosophy is playing and how we want to play. In, Play a game was to be sort of you know, be inside dominant first, really. Because wow. I didn't, I didn't see that there was a lot of truly big, good big men in the league. Um, you know, you get these undersized fives and, and whatever. So I thought if I could get a, a good big, you know, um, a good wing and a good point guard, and so I've got a solid spine, I can build the rest of the team around that. And, and that's pretty much the way I've, I've kind of done, tried to do things over, over my career. Yeah. So we get to season 2004, 2005, the last year of Thames Valley Tigers. Um, were you all understanding that that was going to end there? And I guess there was a dynamic already to try to get a new club set up. What, what was the process there? Was that stressful time? Um, it, it was a little bit, but, you know, to be fair to uh, John, like I think the major issue was with that he, he wants to build a re an arena. Um, on a plot of land that he had there and he had plans drawn up and everything for it and it actually showed me um, the plans when, when we first back in whenever it was 80 whenever when I moved down there yeah. um, but just got kept getting knocked back knocked back knocked back and you know he, he put millions into the team over the years and he just felt that I guess if this wasn't going to happen there's no point having the team anymore but he was what involved just, for 20, 20 years or so just saying that though um, Bracknell Leisure Centre there's I mean <laughs> There was it's a great place to play. That was, that was a true <laughs> home court. I mean, you know, when you, when you think, like you say, Chester and stuff, like, I mean, it was the hard court. It was the, yeah, yeah. that hard floor. But, that, you know, the, when you're talking about saying fans were on top of you, they were sitting on top of you. I remember yeah. literally the, pillar, the, 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 the fan was standing behind <laughs> you as a coach. It was uh, manic. I mean, there was some great... Some of those games, I remember, you know, uh, with my Newcastle teams, those first two years I was in Newcastle. Yeah. We had a great game. I think we went to overtime when Andrew Mavis hit a three, I think, it, uh, to send it to overtime. But you guys beat yeah. it. And it was just like pandemonium. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, no, uh, it was unbelievable. So, no, yeah. there's some real, real amazing games there. You say we sell as Newcastle, you know, London, London Towers, you know, Sheffield, Chris Finch was up there at the time. Just some amazing games. Um, yeah, I mean, John Mike was open and honest about us and about the situation that he wasn't going to continue with the team and, and actually gave us an opportunity to sort of form a, um, form a group, really, if we want to try and take the team over and move it forward, um, which we did with uh, a chap called Mike Davis, um, Richard Mollard, uh, there's, there's Russell Purvin, there's, there's a few other guys who, who are involved with that, just trying to see whether we can actually make this happen. Um, we couldn't do it in, in Bracknell. Um, we then decided that, well, let's try and take it to Guildford. There used to be a team there. They've got a history of basketball in, in Guildford. I'm sure the people will come and, free, you know, if we build it, they will come sort of thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah and, and, and so, yeah, we managed to sort of put this, put this together and put a proposal to the league, in which they accepted. We managed to take the team to, to Guildford, you know, call ourselves Guildford Heat, and uh, the start of another another chapter, really, in my coaching career. Yeah, incredible. And so, 2007, you know, great season, um, two trophies. Uh, what What do you remember about that? And you know, had you had you changed, you know, again, some of your stuff there? The game was starting to change. It was becoming really a little bit more up tempo then. Yeah, yeah. A little bit more open. Yeah, absolutely. It was. It was. It was an interesting time because obviously we at the time we had people like Roderick Wellington, Dean Williams, Martin Gottfried who, who were playing with us, and it's kind of going to them with sort of capping hands and look, we're trying to start this new team. I can't pay you much, but you know we can take to Guildford and let's see what we can do with it. 
Mike Martin was another one. And so I think we had a great British core of players. Yeah. I mean, great. I mean, who would just, just love playing together. Um, you know, we'd, we'd run through a brick wall for each other. And uh, we, yeah, we, we, we took it over there. We, we brought in um, Daniel Gilbert, um, oh, Chad McKnight, uh, Brian Dukes. Brian Dukes came in. And, and these, again, just, just really, really good Americans. Great characters, great guys. Played, you know, played hard. Um, and, and they blended what we already had. And as you say, the game was changing. It was becoming more guard guard orientated and just up and down, up and down. And you know, um, but we had a core who actually still wanted to play together. Um, yes, we had to play a little bit quicker. Um, I'd say Chad and I was kind of an undersized sort of four, four, five. Um, but we were good. Dan Wardrop, I don't know if you remember him. He, we, we had Wardrop's corner because uh, give him give him a give him an inch and he'd knock down a three, no, no problem. So it, that that really was a spectacular four years um, at, at Guildford with those groups, that main group of players, and um, with the odd American coming in here and there. So um, you win the two trophies in 2007, and then you make the jump um, to to Europe. Um, at that time, you know the ULEB Cup was you know a premier competition. You know that was uh, I remember seeing. Uh, I, I was obviously uh, taking that sabbatical type period of, in my career, and yeah. um, I uh, was coming. I came to watch a couple of those games, and I, but I remember when someone came with the draw, and I said, "These teams are Euro League level teams. I mean, this is freaking unbelievable." Yeah. And uh, you know, so what? What was your feeling there? I mean, going into to that competition. Well, well thinking back now, it's, it was nuts. It, it really was crazy because. Yes, we've done really well uh, in this league, and I just don't think anybody really, really knew what they were doing. <laughs> to be honest, as far as playing in the ULEB Cup, we could have gone into the FIBA Cup or the exactly. third tier of European competition, and we would have been much more competitive. But we're playing with DKV Juventus, with Te Telecom, Alba Berlin, Cholet from Lithuania. It was, you know, Bosnia. It's like, come on. Yeah. You know, and these, these guys have millions of euros to spend on their budget and our budgets, whatever, 250, yeah. you know, 1,000 euros. So uh, it was a crazy time and we went through some, some issues with, with as far as how, um, what we needed to do as far as our, our facility wasn't really technically big enough. We played our first game on the ice rink um, there, but just the logistically of just preparing for all that was, you know, was just mad. It was mad, but what an amazing, amazing experience for me as a coach and also for those players, um, you know, within that. And just doing things like that, we were able to track Tony Dorsey, for instance. And, and he was at the back end of his career, but I mean, still, what, what a phenomenal, phenomenal player. Um, but actually, it was a great insight for those players to go and see basketball at another level, to play in, against teams and players who are absolutely another level and just that actually we can work harder we can be better in our domestic league um and, and it, it, it raised our game did you take stuff from from that from the experience did you see some tactics and stuff that other teams were running you felt you know were, were things you could take back and put them into the domestic league what what, what was your takeaways from the european experience uh, yeah right Transitionally, they, you know, they just didn't hang around. The ball moved. The ball wasn't on the floor all the time. It was like, it was out of hands pretty much. And, and everybody was sprinting. No one is jogging or sort of meandering down the court. Everybody is, you know, busting their guts to get down the court. And we, you know, we got caught out so many times because, you know, we're kind of kind of angling back on defense and balls over your head and they're, they're laying it up. Well, where did that come from? So things like that helped us tighten up on our defense. Also forced us to be better offensively as well. And just, again, just taking care of the ball letting the ball do the work, you know, move, move the ball, move yourself sort of thing. Um, and, and, and just playing without the ball more, sure. playing without the ball, pick and, pick and pops, you know, pick and rolls, spacing and timing with the way they did things and, and just the whole composure around the game. Sure. Yeah. So uh, now the Guildford situation, you know, was, was something that um, maybe the club had stretched itself maybe a little bit too far. Um, you know, listen, we're you know, this is not a podcast like a 
uh, a Sam Nito and a Mark Woods to, to talk about those type of things, you know. Um, so you end up in a situation where, I think the club did get into some sort of financial problems. Um, and then you have that, just that mini break, you know, what, what was your, what were your thoughts, you know, finishing that season um, in, you know, in 2009 and then not fully under, not sure where, where you were going to coach next. Yeah, I mean that that was that was a difficult couple of time because we'd we'd had um, a tremendous sort of four, five, five years there. We'd we'd won the league, we'd won the trophy, we'd won the cup, we'd won the playoffs, we'd, and we played in Europe in the space of well, like four or five years. So it was just an, an amazing ride, it was an amazing journey for everybody. So um, having to sort of bring in another investor to look at the club who had to restructure the club, um, you know. The place was going to be big enough for the both of us, so somebody had to go. So I was, I was the one who went, and, and, that, and that was fine. I think I'd, I'd done what I had to do there. I, I, I loved it and I'd enjoyed it. Um, I had no idea what was going to be next for me at all. So it's kind of out of the game for six months. I was doing some some coaching back at the local Bracknell team a little bit as well, doing some camps and things, and then just applying for other opportunities in, in, in sports development and. You know, um, a lot of colleges at the time were, were having these basketball development offices and things as well. So applied for a few of those, um, didn't get them, um, which then led to the uh, Worcester situation coming up. Um, and at the time, I was actually talking to a club in Germany uh, about potentially going there as well and, and made the last two. Uh, and then they decided to go with the, the more experienced uh, coach. Um, but that was good going through that process. Mm. Um, and then, and then obviously the, the, the Worcester situation came up yeah. um, halfway through a season. And um, I, in fact, I called them and said, what are you doing? What are you doing for, for a coach? And, you know, because it's very quiet. Um, I said, I'm, I'm out of work, but I can come and fill in for the rest of the season if you want. And we can go from there. Um, so, yeah, so I was kind of commuting to Worcester a couple of times a week, coaching the team and, and, and playing the games and, and we kind of did a deal after the end of that first season, that half a season um, for a three-year contract. And, you know, now you're changing, now, I mean, the BBO was slightly changing. It was in quite a weird position at that time. We'd gone away from, you know, from the, 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 the heyday, the big, the, the, you know, the, the big money that was involved, the Sky Sports type of um, TV exposure. We were slightly transitioning into a different, different era. Um, you, you get there. But you must have, you know, because obviously I've been there and, uh, you know, we, had, we, we must have felt there was something about this kind of job that there could be some longevity to it, even though they were playing in, you know, a, a kind of a sports arena type complex. And but the university was, a, am I right in thinking that's the first, was that the first, was really the first kind of university for yeah. the BBL club? What, was, what were your feelings with regards to that? Well, that, that, that was very different, um, and it was a, a change from that, yes, they were the first club, if you like, to sort of um, combine with the university, and, and basically half the team were students, you know, doing their, their masters or whatever, and, and then the other half were, were pros, so, you know, you show up to training, you, you know, four or five guys, the rest of them were in class sort of thing, um, but, the, but their thing was really big on the, the, the Bucks championships as well, yeah. um, and, and which again is just more games for me. I didn't really get it at the time, but uh, getting as as I they were just finding another way to make it work. Really, and as you say, that the money really wasn't there anymore. But it's another way to put a product on the floor. And and look, when I went, I just felt that well, this is what we have to work with. And it's one of those situations where there's only one way to go. I I felt with my I felt they'd always had good players, but they didn't have discipline or structure or, or, or anything like that. I mean. You know, going when we played Worcester in the past, you know, they would score 99 points, but they'd let you score 104. And it was very much a high motor game with them. Um, so when I first got there, we started to instill some defensive principles, and, and the games were 70 something, 70 something. I mean, I got help because then the, the supporters weren't used to that. You know, and, and even though we were winning, I was still getting help because, like, is a bit more methodical with what we're trying to do. We're trying to stop teams from scoring and we're, we're trying to have a bit of structure and, and move the ball. Um, but gradually, as we started winning games, we started to you know, play some better bars, people started to understand. Um, but it was, it was 
it was interesting because the guys were playing maybe three games a week, most of them, um, as far as because of the box competition. Yeah. And, and those, those competitions were, were pretty tough as well. Yeah, so, no, absolutely. I mean, and uh, so you, you, I remember you telling me that that was, uh, that, you know, one of your focuses was each season to win that championship, which is you won how many in a row? Yeah, well, we won four in a row. We won four in a row. Um, I mean, it was important for the university for that to happen. You know, they were, they were supporting the professional team as well. Um, so it's important for them to be able to say that, you know, we, and, and to help us recruit players to, to the university of, of a standard who potentially could play in the BBL as well. So, you know, going and saying that we're, we're British champions for the last two years, three years, four years in a row, um, that was great for our sort of player pathway, if you like, as far as bringing in some quality players to study and, and play. Um, but I think, you know, that, that can only take you so far, you know, and, and I think we, 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 we went as far as we could while I was there with it. Um, sure. But again, the league was gradually changing again. At the same time, um, you know, because, of course, um, you know, everyone can be, I mean, you started to get a reputation and, oh, you know, they're just playing their BBL players in, in Bucks. And, but uh, what I have a respect for is that you went in there and you saw that, you know, there was a reason why that you had to do that. You had to win that competition. Um, you know, you really got the university on side for you to be able to, you know, put more resource in and really, you know, push forward with all of the other plans that they had. Um, and I think that that's a, a lesson as coaches we need to be able to take, especially here in the UK. Um, there has to be a degree of flexibility. Um, you've got to be able to mold yourself. We are not, you know, Pablo Lasso or Abramovich where yeah. we turn up and we have, you know, assistant coaches, we have strength trainers, we have a full-time core. We could practice 10 hours a day if we want to. We've got yeah. senior teams. No, we don't have those results. We have to find a way of being, you know, able to mold our, you know, a situation to its and and really elevate that situation. Yeah. And each situation is slightly different. I think it's really commendable what you did there. No, absolutely. And I, I've always been a um, keen one on just saying, "Tell me what the rules are, and I'll play to those rules. No matter what they are, and I will." change them out of that and play to those rules. And that's, that's kind of been a big thing for me. But, but going back to say we're just playing those BBL players in the Bucks, I mean, when you think we had Khalil Irving, we had Daniel, Daniel Belgrave, we had um, Kaelin Rastopoulos, Israeli Lafadeju, you know, guys like this who all, all have played in the BBL. Like these are youngsters who actually, they benefited from that. They benefited from playing with those experienced guys and they've gone on to have professional careers or having professional careers within the game still. So I feel that kind of brought some of those players on and, and given them an opportunity to go on and actually make a career out of play. Well, I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, uh, there's no, uh, um, it, it, you know, just um, I, one of my biggest problems, of, uh, and it's the reason why I started this set of, you know, this podcast series is that we just got to stop, you know, knocking people down in our own sport in this country. And, mm. you know, I'm, I'm specifically talking about something, you know, about coaching and, um, I've always felt it, you know, that, you know, oh, you know, uh, Tony only wins because of this or, you know, Paul's only winning because of this, you know, listen, you know, they they go, you know, we know how much goes into winning, um, yeah. it, you know, at any level. And, and so, you know, we just got to start to understand some of the processes. That's why you know, it's really important to, to listen to you tonight, um, you know, about how that process is put together. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's interesting points, actually, because I think, you know, starting with assistant coaches that I've spoken to and, and mentored and my, my assistant coach now, um, it's very much in that mind, well, they've got this and they've got, I don't really care what they've got. <laughs> this is what we have. And this is what we have to deal with. And so let's stop worrying about them over there. Well, let's worry about ourselves. And he's gradually coming around to that because, you know, that otherwise, you just, you know, just going to drive yourself crazy. You have what you have. And you either choose to work with that or don't. That's I think it's that simple. It's that simple. That's a great phrase. Um, so you get to 2013, 2014. That was the arena year. Is that correct? Yeah. And a tremendous year. 
um, you know, great recruitment of import players. But I mean, like when I look at, I, I walked up those steps and I saw you, the, the picture of the championship winning team and stuff. That I still believe that there, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a real closeness of chemistry in that team. You know, that's not just about some talent. There was one or two talented players, but not like super talents, you know, like that we've uh, seen. No, we. The Chester Jets, you know, uh, of the, the Jet Wash team. Of the of old, yeah. With this crazy talent. <laughs> That, that, that team that year reminded me very much of the team I had in, in Guildford as far as people, players just being together as, as one, you know, working super hard on, on court, um, but then crossing the line and just having each other's back. And it, it was a tremendous year. We'll, we'll creep more than any youth coach. You know, we'll, uh, you know, I had to pull into the side a couple of times where I'm like in training, just like, we need this guy. You know, <laughs> you know, get him out of your pocket, give him his game back, and let him play because we're going to need him. And, and we will go crazy at me because, like, well, you should tell him to play hard. He should be, you know, and you know, Zaya Taylor, Alex Awumi, you know, those guys. But around them, we had guys who understood their roles as far as the support team, if you like. So we had the, the, the Williams brothers. You know, we had Khalil Irving. You know, we had Daniel Belgrade. And, and they were just a phenomenal bunch of players who all knew their roles and, and just, uh, yeah, we just went out there and had a lot of fun, a lot of fun that, that season, um, you know, winning the trophy in Glasgow. Um, and that's the, the first major trophy Worcester had ever won. Um, that, that, that was tremendous. But, and then going to and playing the, the playoff final um, against Newcastle that, that same year was, was, was even better. So, um, yeah, a wonderful time. And it's, it's one of those things where you get teams like that and you have teams like that. You, you want to try and you need to keep them together, have that continuity to move on. And unfortunately, we didn't do that. You know, we didn't do that. And, you know, that, that kind of hurts a little bit. So we, we kind of set our, set our bar high um, to sort of make the playoffs every year because that's what I wanted to do. We wanted to make the playoffs every season as a, as a minimum requirement. Um, but we'd gone beyond that. The next step should have been to win the league, and probably what costs the league. We actually played the night before, or the Friday before the the trophy final, <clears throat> and I think it was against Sheffield. Yeah. And we we need to we need, <clears throat> we, excuse me we need to win that game to to sort of really be around and win the league. And we actually we lost that game, and just I don't know whether we were more focused on uh, the, the the trophy final two days later or not. But uh, we I, didn't play our this I game. Always, I always had a rule. Um, that no matter um, if we ended up playing three games in or five games in seven days at the end of the season, we would never play the Friday before uh, before a cup final. I, 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 I never understood how the BBL allowed that to happen mm -hmm. anyway. I mean, it's, uh, it's a joke. I mean, yeah, that's a tough one for you. Um, yeah, and we, were in, and we were in Scotland as well. So the journey as well was just, it's just nuts. But. It's crazy. Um, so you're at Worcester, um, changes in your philosophy now have super mature as a coach, you know, one of the most experienced coaches, uh, respect from the referees. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> a lot of referees do say that, um, you know, are you super confident now? A lot of game experience, not afraid of the moment. Um, what, what are your feelings at this moment there? Are you, you, you're in control, you know what you want, um, changes in your philosophy too much, as much or not really? No, I just, I just think it's, it's, it's more the same, but then just trying to recruit better, you know, um, trying to make sure your, 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 the training is better and what we're doing is, is again, is an improved, um, is an improved product for the, for the players. Um, obviously just wanting to push on now. I mean, the things after winning the, the, the trophy and, and the playoff final, you now want to push on and try and win. We were so close to winning the league. You want to push on and try and win that. And actually, you know, who knows, maybe you then have another opportunity of playing in Europe. So that's kind of the driving force be, behind that. Um, but the key thing was all about trying to keep that, that special unit together. Um, and we weren't able to do that. And then, you know, you maybe scratch around a little bit. The team you get the next year is maybe not as good as the, the team you had previously and maybe a bit of frustration sets in and you maybe start to sort of coach differently again. Um, and, and, and all the time, things are changing as well because now you're in a, 
an environment where as, as, as far as your, your, your game analysis and, and sort of uh, looking at the opposition and the scouting them and what they do, you start to do more of that because it's accessible to you. It's accessible to you. Yeah. You know, um, you know, so you see, and how much, how much now do you give them? How much can they take? So that process I'm now, I was now learning, you know, because I've had sessions where we've done the scouting report and I've got someone sleeping in the back. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, so um, how much is enough? How much, how much information do they actually need? Some players want more information than others. Some players will come into the office and say, right, I'm going to be guarding whoever, Danny Lewis, somebody. Um, tell me about his game. What, what can we do? And, and you, you do that sort of stuff. So none of that happened previously. No. Really going, going, into, uh, going into Worcester. None of that is very ad hoc, if you like. Um, but now it's kind of just stepping your game up and actually... I think the coach is getting better. There's more access to scouting material, to, to videos. So you have to, you know, move with the times, I guess. And so that's been a big part of the, the last, I guess, the last sort of uh, six, seven, ten years. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, once upon a time, you know, I used to believe, I mean, I carried the camera. Uh, we filmed every game. You know, we'd go and I'd send my assistant coaches to film other games. I mean, obviously now... You know, not only do you have access, like most leagues around the world have, you know, some sort of um, game access, but, you know, we have, you know, BBL has Synergy. It's the number one yeah. in the world. I mean, you can have 100, 150 clips, you know, on just one, you know, kind of offensive set of type possessions, you know. Yeah. Or, you know, there's 100 clips here of a team. So, yeah, I mean, the infinite... Uh, that's why I'm now at that stage, especially with young coaches, say, look, you know, guys, there really aren't many secrets. You know, do you want my playbook, uh, my video playbook? I gave that to a lot of uh, coaches this summer um, from Japan yeah. because, you know, it's not hard for any coach to put that video playbook together, you know, as a scout. No. Yeah. There, there's so much video out there. So it's a, it's a real interesting one. Um, you, you moved on to Plymouth again, trying to stay away from being purely just even the chronological time, but what's, what's now kind of a daily practice? What, what are your core, what are your core components of a daily practice session? Do you have them or do you, do you divide your practices up? Um, like one day offense, one day defense, you know, one day scout, or are you, you have some core components that you won't take out of a practice. Well, I mean, we defense is certainly within our session, pretty much every session. And that's the, we, you know, yeah, I don't think you can win championships or games without playing defense. And to be fair, this this past season we didn't play much defense, so we're probably doing more defense than anything else. Um, guys just didn't get it, but defense is always going to be there, whether that's for the whole session or just part of the session. Um, we will split it up into then, um, you know, offensive sets, individual sets. We do a lot of two on two, a lot of three on three situations um, within our within our training sessions. I feel that that's the game. The game is three on three, basically, but five people on the court, or it's a two on two situation. Um, and 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 you, you transitional stuff. Um, and in with that, during the week we will have our S and C sessions. Um, now whether that's Weights, core stability, or circuit sessions, or, or, or just massage. That's all implemented now as well with, with what we do. And then we will do uh, three video sessions as well. Um, so a post game um, analysis, um, and then we'll do a video on the team we're next playing on individuals. So that they keep five, six players. Um, and then the next one will be on their their sets. Okay. Their sets and and. And that's later on in the week. So we will then take those sets we've just seen on the video, put them on the floor, and we just walk through how we're going to defend certain situations. So, so we've gone from actually just training twice a week and not doing much else to actually giving the players a lot of information, a lot of information. Um, and these are hard copy as well. We video, video them out to them. Um, and I don't do that. I have my assistant coach does that for me, and, and he is... Uh, you know, Danny McGeehan, he is fantastic at it. And, uh, almost to the point where it gives him too much information. <laughs> okay. Um, when you're doing a um, really interesting one for, 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 because you've done this and you must have had huge success in this area, but let's say 
uh, post-game review. Um, it can be it can be in the locker room, but you know how you you deal with players post-game. Um, you we all know that players now it's just a fact are you know much more susceptible to you know when when criticism comes their way they you know they find <laughs> instead of that once upon a time being coaching you know now they they really feel slighted um yeah. how, how are you dealing with your with your post game reviews um you know post game in locker room have you changed a lot you know are you hard on the mm -hmm. team if it if it's played poorly you know are you holding players accountable how are you doing that i mean that's a really important yeah it's i mean <laughs> Generally now, I mean, before I just call them out straight after the game, I'm hot and whatever, and, and I'm saying stupid things. And generally now, I will give it 24, 48 hours. Interesting. So I've got a time, chance to just reflect on it. And, and actually, more times than not, when you go back and you look at the film, you actually haven't played that bad. It just looks terrible at the time. And, right. and you know, you, you got all the shots you wanted to take, and if you took those shots today, you'll make them, you know? Um, so I, I think for me, it was a lesson just learning on just, okay, that happened, it wasn't great. Don't say anything now, because you might say something you, you're gonna regret later um, and reflect on it. And actually, if it doesn't need calling out later, then I'll call them out. But I wanna see that video first and just you know, you know, reflect on, on, on the game myself and, and, then, uh, and then I sort of deal with it from there. I, I tell young coaches that all the time. Um, there's no, not even a question for the first 10 years of my professional career. Um, I go crazy after a game. I go crazy after we won, thinking we played really <laughs> badly. You know, like yeah, yeah. we we're lucky to win that game, and then I realized we weren't. And then, or yeah. you know, we lose a game. I'm going mad. We actually played really, really well. You know, yeah, we've been through that. You know, for definite. What about post game review? I mean, it's such an important um, area in this day and age now. Um, you know, it, it, do you have a certain way of dealing with players when? Are they making the same mistake? You know, are you conscious um, that sometimes you're showing too many, you know, clips of a player making that same mistake? How, how are you doing? Yeah, that? yeah, and, and this is the something I've sort of spoken to my um, assistant coach Daniel about how we do that, and we <clears throat> you can, sometimes it can just be bad, 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 bad all the time, and actually there has to be some good in there. Um, and, and so, <clears throat> as far as going from having these long video sessions, I mean. I shorten it down now, you know, we, we, only want, we only need four or five clips of a situation and really um, to hit home. And actually, if a player is making the same mistake over and over again, then he'll just be called into the office and we'll just sit down, we'll go through it and we'll, 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 we'll talk about it. Um, sometimes they, they don't see it. Some, sometimes they, even, even on the video, when they see it, they don't see it, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's when it becomes really hard. That's when it becomes really hard because if, if they're watching on the video and they, they still think, that's what now I'm in you know, defensive rotation, if you like, I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. Right. You're not, you're that, not. Is a hard one. that is a hard one to deal with. And you just got to, well, it's one of those things, you either got to keep going and hoping the player's going to get on with it mm -hmm. and, 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 and improve and work to improve that, or you, know, you then inevitably changes have to be made sure. down, down the line, which is, which is the hard part of the job, I guess. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, are you finding, uh, last question, like present, are you finding players uh, easier to coach, harder to coach? What, what's, what's your feel of the, the players, that, you know, in this day and age that you're coaching at this moment? Well, it's hard. It's like I kind of said earlier on, I think I'm doing less coaching now, more teaching because they don't know how to do it. Not, not everybody. I'm putting a blanket over everybody, not everybody, but a lot of players don't know how to do certain things so you end up teaching more than you're actually coaching the x and o's and the sort of the technical and tactical side of it really um and i, I think the last two three years certainly the last two years i've been doing more of that um and you may get one or two players who get it but that's not enough you, you, you know you need we well, need more players that that, that get it and they're just, as you said, they're fragile. A lot of these players now, I think they're, they're, they're mentally fragile, physically weak, um, we, which is a shame. It's, it's, it's not how it used to, it's not how, it's, how it used to be, but this is what I'm seeing more of now. You think and you, you can't criticize. 
I think that's, uh, I'm just interested to know your thoughts on this, but you think that we've, we're, our, the player this, at this stage is starting to lose that real competitiveness that, you know, will run through the brick wall type of mentality, especially the, the gamer, you know, the guy that you can just guarantee is going to, like, I'll give you an example, um, Trey Moore was, you know, I'm, if he listens to this, he'll kill, kill me. <laughs> Probably the worst practice player I've ever coached, you know, hated to yeah. do any type of drills, um, gave almost minimal effort in practice, but boy, when he crossed the line and that ball went up, that guy was absolute killer. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering if these younger players uh, are, are kind of, you know, they're just, they're doing a lot of skill, disposable skill development, even though you're saying you're having to reteach a lot of it. But yeah. just, I just feel that we're, there's some players are great athletes, you know, got potential, but they just don't have that, that killer instinct. I, I think, I think you're right. I think, you know, we, I think players or people in general maybe are brought up not being criticized or being told positive things all the time, even if they're doing something bad, that you, you've got to give this positive message out. Um, and, you know, you, you know, you're talking about some players different, you know, John, John McCall said he had trained hard, played hard, he was a phenomenal player. Zaire Taylor, right, when I had him at Worcester, he, he wasn't a great trainer at all, but I knew that when he crossed the line, yeah, you know, he was going to be phenomenal, you know, his game, and, and he was a phenomenal player. Um, and then I've, I've had players this past year who, then they're, they're never going to be world beaters, but they'll look at me in the face, and I try and be honest, look, this is not your game, you are not an offensive threat, I want to come in, I want to play defense, take care of the board, get a layup, you take it, whatever. But coach, I think I'm the best scorer on this team. Yeah. What can you know? What, <laughs> what can you say to that? You know, and because clearly this kid has never been told a bad thing in his life, and clearly he has this. And it's great to have that self belief, but you also have to have some realism. You know, I'm, I'm five foot eight. I'm probably five foot six. Actually, I'm not going to go play in the post. Coach, I'm a great post player. You know, it just doesn't make sense. So I think there's a lack of realism sometimes and I think that potentially is holding players back from actually reaching their true potential as a player. Yeah, very good point. Um, okay, a couple of quick ones here. Uh, you've got a winning BBL percentage, 60, basically 60%. That's an incredible six out of 10 games you're going to win. Um, you know, that's, that's an awesome stat. So greatest or really highlight career, career moments for you. And they don't necessarily have to be championships. Any, any, any kind of really moments you, you really that stand out for you? Well, I think, uh, I think actually my first professional game as a coach stood out. Um, Manchester Evening News Arena, Nick Nurse is coaching. Wow. We're in front of 10,800 people. Uh, and we win the game on the buzzer. Awesome. <laughs> right. That, I mean, you can hear a pin drop. That, that, that was great. Um, you know, obviously playing in the European competitions were, were, were absolutely just phenomenal sort of experiences um, for me. And I think, you know, every championship we've been into winning the league was, was phenomenal. The teams I had in, in Guildford was, was absolutely outstanding. Um, and, and winning that first, you know, playoff championship, you know, finals, uh, that, you know, those moments really, really stick with me. Great. Now, in uh, talking about British basketball, uh, especially the coaching fraternity, um, any, any thoughts um, you, like, I mean, I, I, again, reason for doing this series is that um, trying to showcase coaches, uh, especially in, their diff in, in a different light than just a normal interview, um, do you think that uh, you've been underutilized um, in, 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 in the coaching fraternity? Or also, do you think, you know, what's your thoughts about us as a coaching fraternity as well? The fact that we probably don't have one. Is... Well, yeah, I was going to say, we don't, we don't really have one, I think. Um, I think nearly every season, somebody tries to start one and it kind of doesn't really snowball the way it should do. Um, you know, we... <laughs> I feel that coaches don't are afraid to share information. 
humble. I think that, I think the afraid to show for it. And as you said, you know, you, it's all there anyway. It's all there anyway. So it's literally just talking about ideas and philosophies and you know, just different ways of doing things. So uh, why the why be why be afraid to share information? And in I, I never really un understood that one. Um, I'm going to say that I've been. I'm assuming that you've always had your practices open <laughs> to any coach that wanted to come to see you coach. Practice. Absolutely, absolutely, and and again, that's how I've got my assistant coach now, Danny. You know, he, he was just a student at, at Worcester, and you know, he he was just hanging around, and and he was always there. And in the end, I've invited him into the sessions, literally invited him in so he can hear what they're saying, what's going on, and whatever. And and he's just taken to it like a duck to water, and he's gone away and researched certain stuff, and he's learned more and more about the game. It's good, but the practices are always open sessions. Anybody can come and you know see a practice. I, I, we really don't have a, an issue with that. Say they can have the playbook. You know, it's all about at the end of the day, if you can execute, you execute well, it doesn't matter who, who knows what. So um, I've always been open to that. And, but very rarely do you have young coaches coming forward and say, oh, do you mind if I come down and, and see a session or call up and say, like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? It's a, it's a, it's a rarity. Mm, interesting. Okay, let's go with um, four quick questions. Um, I call this rapid fire, so you haven't got many seconds to answer them. Uh, um, favorite player to coach? Now, that's, this is an unfair question, specifically to you, uh, to me, to a number of people. You coach hundreds, thousands of players, and, but you know, to make you say one, uh, which you probably already said, so... Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, you see, I've, I've posed some great players, um, but I've got, to, I've got to give it to John McCall because he's the first player I signed and just the, his character and his personality and the fact he could play in any position he wanted to play. Um, and he's a winner. Um, yeah, I had a lot of fun with him. Really a lot of fun. Favourite all-time coach, basketball coach? Hey, um, Phil Jackson. Jackson, okay. That's Bill Jackson, and I'm sure you know why. <laughs> I just, you know, I just, I just think he, he just made his players believe he was a calming influence. Obviously, he had the greatest player in the world on his team, which always helps. Um, but that whole support team around him, I, I think, uh, yeah, I just like the way he did things. Yeah, I could see some things definitely that you know that you relate to on that. That's awesome. Uh, go, uh, do you have a go-to saying? Um, that you use often, um, like motivational saying, something you use all, a lot of the times with your teams? Um, yeah, I, I say to the players a lot, do your job. <laughs> Basically, do your job. That's I mean, simple, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's uh, um, a Bill Belichick. Again, you, you, yeah, you're getting paid, do your job. <laughs> Bill Belichick, New England Patriots. That's all you need to know about that statement. Yeah. Do your job. Yeah. It's an awesome start. I mean, actually, even for about using that myself a couple of times as well. <laughs> um, any like a favorite drill that you um, that you run on a consistent basis? I mean, you you could describe it pretty quickly, um, but or yeah, I mean, I've got a couple of transition drills that I like to do, which kind of build up to a five and five situation. So it might be a, a two on one plus one, and then we go to a, a three on two plus. Plus, plus one, so you end up playing three on three in the survives, and you keep going until you're in the five and five situation, and then once you get to a five and five situation, you play games to three. Um, and it's, it's, it's a good conditioning drill, but also you can work on your defense on that way, and as far as, as, far as uh, you know, on the fast play, you've got a three on two situation, looking at those shots there and being aggressive, or, or defending against that, you know. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, and you can do that sort of whatever time limit, sort of 10, 15, 20 minutes if you wanted to. Um, and uh, it's a good uh, transition drill. Great. Love that. That's great stuff. Okay, last question. Because uh, like I said, we can go in so many different <laughs> directions with this stuff. But um, I only try, want to try to keep this as, as, as short as possible. Um, talking about your um, journey in the game um, and specifically talking about um, the, the, the social justice agenda at this moment. You know, what are your thoughts on that, and how British basketball is going to, you know, uh, to work with that? And also, 
Um, I've been very privileged, you know, to start this series with, you know, two of the most prominent, um, you know, black coaches in, in, in the country. That's obviously um, Curtis Xavier and yourself. Um, as a black coach, what, what are your thoughts on, 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 on the agenda at this present time? I mean, I, I mean, clearly no one can condone what went on in, in America with, with Floyd and, and uh, that was just, just appalling. Um, and it's, it's a shame that it takes something like that for people to start actually realizing what's been kind of been going on for, for many a year, really. Um, so that that's disappointing. I think, you know, obviously when I came into the game um, as a coach, it was purely because I was given an opportunity um, as a, as, a, as a young you know, black coach. But I think the base for that was having been at that club for so long, um, I was get afforded that opportunity. Um, otherwise, I don't think necessarily that, that would have happened. And I'm not even sure how many black coaches there were in the league at that time. Um, I do know now, obviously, there are 40% of the coaches in the league are, are, are black. Um, two of them are part owners or, of, of a club, so they've kind of forge their own destiny with that and I'm not sure what opportunities um, you know young black coaches are getting um, you know within the game uh, whether they're getting those opportunities um, do you do you feel do you feel that um, our sport has you know um, ha there is an issue with, with, with regards to representation um, I mean we can all look at the situation in, in a different way, but, you know, obviously um, as, as, as a white coach, you know, I've always explained to people that um, I've never coached, you know, color or race. Um, you know, I've coached talent, um, you know, I've coached people as, as equal as possible um, and gave as many opportunities. Now um, yeah. there are as, as a white coach, as someone that is not black, um, I have to then, understand and have empathy to what goes on before and after a session there that there's going to be potential issues um and those are the things i have to be have a an, an education and an understanding and of course my background is completely different to many 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 white people because i grew up in an inner city um east yeah. suburb um, and was 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 in a multicultural society, but that doesn't mean that I didn't see racism um, and I didn't experience it in, in and see it, you know, firsthand. But as a as as one of the prominent, um, you know, black coaches in our sport, I mean, do you think that we have to do more um, for representation of, of young black coaches or players? What what's your what's your thought process on that? Well, I've, I've, you know, I, I can't, I can honestly say that I've stood, you know, being here that I haven't, I don't feel that I've actually um, been subject to racism. Now, whether it's because I'm not looking for it <laughs> or just not aware of it, I'm, I'm not sure. I think I've been extremely fortunate to uh, have worked some really, really good people and I've made the most of those opportunities and I've worked hard to, to be successful so I can that I have been able to have some sort of longevity. Um, and I think that's part of my own doing. Um, I don't, like yourself, I don't see color when I'm coaching or recruiting or, or even if I'm working for my boss, I really don't see it. And it's only now, I guess, with all that's been going on, you start to look at things maybe in a different light. And, and that's, that's potentially, potentially wrong because maybe I'm now being brainwashed with, 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 with certain things that really are not happening. Um, but I say clearly what has happened in the States has brought a lot of things to light. And I think you know, there are some talented um, you know, black coaches out there. And, and to me, it's like, are you doing enough to put yourself in a position to get an opportunity? And then actually when you get that opportunity, are you now prepared to work hard to keep that opportunity so i think you know i actually think it works both ways sure. you know, i don't think should you know jobs should just be handed out just because you're black you know or, or anything like that i think you know you've got to earn that right regardless of how that may be um, i think within basketball at this moment we're not big enough as a sport in this country and so i think people tend to look locally or, or stay with what they know as far as coaches are mm. 
Um, and I think I was, I was kind of in that situation myself at Tens Rally, having been there for over 10 years. Um, the owner knew me, I knew him and blah, blah, blah. And he kind of, okay, I'm going to give you this opportunity and you know, you do with it what you will. Um, and, and, I, and I grabbed that. Just one last point on that. Um, I, I, expl- I said this to Curtis last week. Um, our sport has a, uh, a, a tag in, in the national kind of media that we're this you know, black urban type sport. Do you think that this is our time? You know, even with how bad this, you know, that something has happened, something that's in the world is, you know, that it, it, it's, it's wrong. But we as a sport should be grasping this and saying, actually, we can help make the change. We can help, you know, in a social justice because we're the sport of the young urban population. Do you, you feel that there's... there's the, the, I think you're right. I think there's, there's an opportunity. There is an opportunity. And this, this could be the time to do that and, and you know, to actually go out there and, you know, try and, um, I guess... The, be better at what we do, be better at how we, we work within these inner cities and, and bringing people into the game. Um, I think there is, is a real opportunity now to do that. Um, and, and it's only going to be a short opportunity, I feel. So it's kind of, you grab that, you grab it by, by the neck right now, and you, you get on with it. Otherwise, I think the moment will be lost. Great. Coach, Listen, uh, I, I really appreciate the, the, the time you've spent. Um, I mean, you know, one of the most successful coaches uh, this country has ever seen, um, you know, with the, this huge resume, continuing um, the project in Plymouth. I know we didn't really speak much about, but I know there's some big things that have been planned for there. And uh, um, I just uh, want to say thank you, you know, for coming on the Pick and Pop podcast and, uh um, good luck in, in this up and coming season, hopefully when it actually starts. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's great, Tony. Thank you very much. It's, it's been nice walking back down memory lane and uh, you know, I totally enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.